Uh, first and foremost, we want to extend a warm welcome to each of you. We're certainly getting, we're currently getting everyone out of the waiting room to ensure a smooth start. So thank you for your patience. And we'd also like to inform you that this session is being recorded and will be available on the MAPC YouTube page. And the link to the recording will be shared with you in a follow-up email after the session. To ensure a smooth and focused session today, everyone will be muted throughout the presentation to avoid disruptions. If a participant becomes disruptive during the event, they will be immediately removed from the webinar and won't be able to rejoin. And additionally, on the unlikely event of a Zoom bombing incident, the meeting will be terminated promptly to protect our discussion. Now, as we begin, I'd kindly like to ask you to take a moment to rename yourselves, to include your first and last name, and if possible, the town or organization you're representing. You can also add that information into our chat so we can see where everyone is coming from. And to rename yourself, you just click on the participants button at the bottom of your Zoom window, locate your name in the participants list, click more, and select rename. You can see the directions there on the screen. And to engage with us during the session, please use the chat feature to submit your questions. Feel free to put your questions in the chat at any point during the talk. And while we'll do our best to address as many questions as possible, please understand that we may not have time to answer all of them during the Q&A session at the end. I'd also like to show you how to change your view settings so that the speaker or speakers are spotlighted. This way you can have a better view of the content and you can do this by clicking on the view options in the top right corner and selecting speaker view from the drop down menu. And if anyone experiences any technical issues during our session, please don't hesitate to reach out to our tech support staff Anunth. Anunth is here to assist you and ensure a smooth experience for everyone. Um, before we move forward, I would like to take a moment to give you a bit of a background on the series. Um, spanning, so Rooted in Nature spans five thematic sessions as we've gathered experts from Indigenous communities right here in Massachusetts to offer an exploration of Indigenous perspectives on climate resilience and sustainability. The series supports the impl implementation of Metro Common 2050, our regional land use plan particularly our strategies to advance climate mitigation and resiliency and inclusive growth and development. It also aligns with a broader shift in the climate resiliency landscape, recognizing and uplifting indigenous knowledge as a vital resource. An example of this shift is the recent formation of the Center for Braiding Indigenous Knowledge and Science at UMass Amherst, led by Dr. Sonia Adelaide. The series by MAPC mirrors this progressive approach aiming to enhance climate adaptation strategies by fostering a deeper understanding of indigenous cultures and encouraging collaborations for cross municipality projects that are geared to address the impacts of climate change collectively. So now I'd like to turn it over to Barry Keppard, um, who will be sharing a quick message about how the series relates to the work being done at MAPC. Thanks, Lindsay, too. And thank you, Kristen, as well, for the chance to um, offer some thoughts kind of before you get started, too. Um, I was going to start in a place just in terms of connection among people and um, a frame sometimes we'll use as we think about social capital are these three frames of, of bonding, that idea of how you connect with those most closest to you, those you may share a background or history with. The idea of how we then also kind of bridge from those groups to other groups that are like us who might be elsewhere who we may want to connect with because we share some value. And then in making those connections, this idea of linking of how we then move that to a place of power and change. And a reason I, I bring them up because I see so much of that in Kristen's work, um, that idea of both kind of linking to culture and people, but also understanding how that's rooted in the ground that they live on, the customs they have, the food they prefer and they'd like to produce. And all that then connecting to a much larger network of what it means in terms of not only indigenous knowledge and history here in Massachusetts in the greater Boston area, but what it also means nationally. And lastly, how is that being linked to real change, both to recognize the power that sits there, the power that's maybe been discriminated or not allowed to be unleashed the way it could be, and the changes we can make in that direction too. And just when it comes to MAPC, I think we try to look to models 
like that when it comes to climate to realizing that yes we need to worry about emissions and yes we need to worry about things like our natural environment but ultimately so much of this is coming about people how we're connecting to one another the care we provide for one another and really the respect for the really long history that exists that can give us a much better place to move into the future too so i'm just i'm really excited to be here really excited to, to listen to you Kristen. And just thank you for the work that you do and the model you provide to our region too so I think I'm going to turn it back to Lindsay real quick just to yep. check. And I think I'm yes, and we are actually joined by um, Mark Drayson, who is our executive director for MAPC. So if Mark would like to share um, some words, because I know this has been a big agency uh, initiative. Um, so, Mark, I'll turn it to you. I wasn't expecting that, which is why I'm eating lunch. Sorry. <laughs> and why I was muted. Um, th this is a big deal to us, um, expanding our connections with and what we can learn from indigenous people in our region and their history in our area is um, something that I'm particularly and very personally committed to. I'm really glad that several of our departments, I think it's fair to say led by the arts and culture department, but, but many other departments are engaged in this effort. Uh, and we hope to you know, move it forward, um, not only through this series, but through our ongoing educational work and also our public policy and planning. Work. So uh, that's about all I have to say, Lindsay. Well, thank Thanks you. To all the participants. Yeah, thank you both Barry and Mark uh, for saying those words. And we appreciate both of you sharing your valuable insights and showing how this uh, series and what Kristen will be presenting really underscores the importance of um, how MAPC is trying to take a more comprehensive approach to the work that we are doing. So um, let's move forward with why everyone is here and introduce our main speaker, uh, Kristen Wyman. So Kristen is the co-founder for the Eastern Woodlands Rematriation, a grassroots collective of tribal peoples restoring indigenous foodways in the Northeast. In her full-time position as co-director of the Global Movements Program with Why Hunger, Kristen supports and nourishes connections between global movements and initiatives led by indigenous peoples, especially processes of agroecology, food sovereignty, and climate justice. And prior to joining Why Hunger, Kristen worked as a consultant and program manager to several youth and Native American organizations at local, state, and national levels. And she holds a BA with a concentration in legal studies, political science, and Native American studies from the University of Massachusetts Amherst. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to Kristen Wyman, and we're eager to hear your perspective today. So Kristen, the virtual floor is now yours. Thank you, um, Lindsay, uh, much credit to you for all your organizing efforts in this. Uh, I'm sure it took like a lot of patience and corralling of just getting us all together. And you'll see through this presentation, I mean, that's the reality of us as indigenous people. I always say it's like a full-time job to resist and be alive. And then at the end of the day, you know, we all got to make ends meet and, and have a livelihood and where those worlds collide, it's been a constant, struggle. Um, and so oftentimes there are so many interested folks and agencies um, and organizations that are really doing the work of wanting to hear from Indigenous people. And then um, we have a lot of challenges with being able to respond to those calls. And so, Lindsay, just a lot of credit and gratitude to you for your patience. And um, I'm really grateful to the Metropolitan Area Planning Council for hosting me today for this conversation and to Mark and to Barry for teeing it up. Um, I'm a little nervous. I, I really don't like the spotlight on myself. And if it were up to me, we'd all be in a field somewhere doing the work. Um, you know, we all know there's lots to do. And um, yeah, I wish we could be outside, you know, getting our hands dirty and contemplating how we move forward in um, today's crisis situation. Uh, a lot of gratitude to everybody who showed up today. I'm like, wow, um, it's really a privilege for me to be able to share what I'm about to share and to share these teachings with 
um, a room full of over 100 people, and I'm sure others will listen in on the recording. Um, just acknowledging and appreciating you all for joining me at this time of day. And I really do hope you all are eating lunch right now. So thanks for um, having me during this lunch hour. Um, so without further ado, I'll give a quick introduction to myself, Natessa Wies Kristen. I'm Kristen, I'm from the Nipmuc people. We're freshwater people. Um, I grew up in my ancestral homelands from the Thomas Spean clan. So if most folks are familiar with Spean Street and Natick. I descend from the original proprietors of that territory, the folks who are also known as doing the land grant deal with um, John Elliott. And um, my grandmother married into the Mashpee Wampanoag community. And so um, I'm very much bicultural in that sense. My mother was raised in that community and I grew up thinking that's who I was. Um, and uh, yeah, I have two daughters. I'm a single mother and raising two amazing girls who I think are featured in my slideshow today. Um, but my oldest is also of the Diné clan, the Diné people, known, also known as the Navajo people. Um, and my second, uh, my youngest daughter is an enrolled Mashpee Wampanoag tribal member. Um, so I'm gonna try to do this screen share. I also just wanna give a heads up that I have a lingering cough. Um, so hopefully everybody has patience with me. And then again, as I get excited to share and because we're not actively moving, I can tend to move a little fast. So you might just see me trying to, to pace this presentation because there's so many things that I'm really excited to teach you about. Um, so I am going to share screen. Um, it's tagged to speaker. Oh, I'm gonna remove my spotlight. <laughs> um, So um, yeah, today I'm like really just hoping to, and actually I'm just trying to move my toolbar for a minute, there we go. Uh, yeah, I'm excited to talk a little bit about agroecology and rematriation as like a guiding force to the work that I do. Um, we'll get into those definitions and what they really mean, um, but essentially we understand, and we as in, um, Kind of the collective of tribal folks. And then as mentioned in the introduction, I do a lot of work at the global level. So I'm privileged to hear from a lot of indigenous folks all over the globe um, and a lot of overlaps in kind of how we see ourselves and our connection to the environment and to um, the land and where we see our liberation and freedom intertwined with that. So uh, as mentioned, I'm Nipmuc, um, we're people of the fresh water. What you'll see in this map is like a really intricate map way of a uh, map of all of the traditional village sites in the area of Nipmuc territory. Um, and really I see myself as somebody that's born into these waterways. And if you consider like we call ourselves Nipmuc people, Nipi means water, we're people of the fresh water we're literally named after, after the landscape that we're born into. Uh, and many tribal communities across the globe have their names represent kind of the, the geological feature or where they're born into a lot of their cosmovisions and creation stories become that. And I think that's really important when we're talking about uh, conservation and climate resilience is that intertwined with our identity, our, our collective identity, um, is this sense that we are it and it is us. And so um, it's this automatically kind of codified ingrained teaching that um, the well being of uh, our landscapes and our, um, our people and our non human kin is really important to our own survival and well being. Uh, this, this statement is from the Nipmuc Indian Development Corporation which is a small tribally run, mostly tribal female elders that run this organization that serves a lot of the cultural um, land stewardship 
economic needs of the Nipmuc community. Um, and I really wanted to include it just to emphasize that we see ourselves as being inseparable from the landscape. We've been here for thousands of years, uh, codified in all of our teachings, um, codified in all of our arts, traditions, language, even the mapping of the landscape is sort of this ecological understanding um, and relationship-based knowledge system. And here's just another close look, right? You can see really all of those waterways and many of these things, many of these lines are pathways between the village sites. And so even though I come from Natick, I also understand um, we traveled extensively. There were different roles within the community that made it possible for us to reach so many different places. And I'll talk a little bit about our agricultural traditions as an indicator of just how much we have traveled as a people. Uh, but to really understand the scale of how we identify and who we're connected to. So the perspectives I bring to this conversation, I just really wanna own my bias and everything that I'm explaining, but it's also gonna give you a good indicator of who I am and what I'm bringing to this conversation. Um, so in, there's a lot of images happening in this, in this one slide. I think I could start by just saying, you know, adding to what I've already shared about who we know we are, right? We know that we're a water people and that we're born into this network of waterways and have a responsibility for caretaking those waterways and all of the beings that come from it. Um, you know, we're also an impacted people. And so, if we were to have lived the trajectory of understanding our teachings, our cultural teachings from our Cosmo vision. So I'm not really talking today about the story of Sky Woman. Uh, you can learn about that story in Robin Kimmerer's work, Braiding Sweetgrass. It's a very well-known um, piece of work. And I usually do start my presentations with the story of Sky Woman as an indicator of really how our teachings of collectivity and responsibility are, um, are mirrored in that story, but many of the cosmovisions of indigenous peoples around the world really mirror geological features and um, trajectories in those regions. And so uh, there's a lot of scientific uh, fact behind those cosmovisions, um, but really many of them teach this story of responsibility and collectivity. Um, we're an impacted people because as settlement happened in our regions, in our territory, this very different perspective of relating to land and relating to each other was really imposed upon us. So it in many ways impacted the trajectory that we had in carrying through our cosmovision. Um, although we've never abandoned that, um, I think over time, anyone that's really interested in doing the research and learning about indigenous livelihoods in this particular area of Turtle Island, we'll see like we've resisted in so many ways. You know, we, we are many in many ways a landless people in our own homelands, but we've never gone away. And while we've been impacted, impacted by settlement and colonialism um, and all sorts of things from disease to racism, um, systemic oppression, uh, policies, um, and even developing kinship with uh, new peoples, right, that are not from this land. Uh, we have adapted over time, but we've never really abandoned the core of our identity and who we are. Um, so there's an image of John Elliott, known as the Apostle to the Indians. Uh, it, this is an image depicted actually in the post office, uh, the Natick post office. I'm sure a lot of people are familiar if we have folks from Natick. Um, but this is the story of the removal and we're, we're coming up on the anniversary of that. So in October of 1675, by proclamation of the Mass Bay Colony, now this, this is government policy. We were, my ancestors were forcefully removed in the middle of the night, uh, mostly women and children, because at that time it was during King Philip's war. It was a, a very, it's known as one of the bloodiest battles in American history. Um, it happened right here in our soils. Um, it wasn't a 
one side versus this side. There was a lot of complexity to it, even within my family line. Um, a lot of folks either siding with the English um, as a mechanism of, of survival or our people and being known as praying people. Um, that was also a mechanism of survival. And then, you know, violent resistance was also a mechanism of survival. And there were no uh, real, there wasn't this one side of natives against the colonists. And so it made it very complex at that time. And because the war was getting so intense, even the quote unquote friendly Indians, the praying Indians became a threat. And that is why we were so easily subjected to the removal. And it really, it's important to know that because no tribal community is the same. And so I'm speaking from the perspective of a tribal community that was very closely situated to Boston, which is a major port at that time. Um, and so it's a, it's a really unique history of how we were very much impacted very early on in comparison to our sister tribes in the area because of the close proximity to Boston, um, access to market, uh, demand for land, et cetera. Uh, so I'm an, I'm, I'm a survivor of uh, an internment camp. Um, most of the folks did not survive the, the winter on Deer Island. And just to put in perspective at this time, right, um, we would have been finishing up our harvest, uh, storing our crops for the winter, making sure our seeds are, are good for the following season. Um, putting a lot of care and love into that and it's a time of celebration and we were violently removed from that ability by chains and shackles and uh, removed to an island that really did not have much to offer in terms of um, shelter against really intense winter storms. Um, that's not a time to go clamming because the ground is freezing. And so, you know, food was very much weaponized but we don't often talk about that in the story of Deer Island just, you know, I, I worked for the Boston Harbor, Harbor Islands National Park for several years and then my graduate studies focused on that and really the driving force behind it was just like we keep telling the story of just like natives being interned on this island and then kind of move quickly beyond it because it's difficult to talk about but there's so much more to it. Um, so that has been really also a driving force in a lot of my research and the work that I've done to have it be very participatory, to have all stakeholders engaged, because as much as it's difficult to have a lot of these con um, conversations and different perspectives, and quite frankly, oftentimes I feel like it doesn't resonate, um, maybe because my experience is very unique, but it's not easy to continue teaching and feel like like we're just still not understanding, um, but it's still a critical component of my work. And maybe I get to retire early and just like live a life of <laughs> bliss in my homeland. I mean, that would be the dream. Um, there's a picture of this palm tree that is not local, but uh, in my work with global movements, you can see that a photo of me with other folks. I went to an intercontinental conference in Panama on people affected by dams. So that's actually the Pan Panama Canal. Um, a lot of the work that I do, again, is organizing with other marginalized, impacted folks who are still struggling for sovereignty. And um, yeah, I'm a person also impacted by dams, and you'll hear a little bit about my work there. I mentioned Deer Island. What you see with the folks in the canoe is we do an annual um, paddle every year commemorating the forced internment. Um, and we paddle across Har Boston Harbor and up Charles River which we get a lot of looks and a lot of people yelling at us, telling us we're going the wrong way. But if you hear of anybody doing that, just remember we are going the right way. We're symbolically bringing our ancestors home and it's not an easy paddle. It's very arduous, especially going up river after you've already crossed the harbor. It's pretty intense, um, but it's an important moment for us to remember, um, to remember, to remember what happened and not forget and remember we're a part of that memory. And um, it's an opportunity for us to come together and realize uh, that the struggles of today may be pale in comparison to what our ancestors went through. And I live in Hall. Um, yeah, I, I often wonder, I grew up in Natick, but I live in Hall. So it's just interesting that that's, and I probably want to spend the rest of my life there, um, but that's the resting place of my ancestors. And 
and yeah, I threw in some food there. <laughs> They're important. Thanks for bearing with me so long on that one slide. Um, so what are we working towards? Where, you know, what is my goal? Like, what is my passion? What keeps me moving, even though it's not easy work, um, is the right to food sovereignty. Um, and it's not just about food, right? Like, it's not just about food access. Um, it's about the food that's important to us, right? Because we see our food ways as our kin. Um, and in some of these images, you can see like the corn husk dolls that are being made and up in the right corner, the way we braid that corn to have it dry out. Um, there's a vase with an image of a fiddlehead. You know, a lot of our language, um, our, even, our, even our political formations, a lot of our artistic traditions was not just, not simply just to create, but it was to really codify our cosmo visions, our teachings, our um, changes and adaptations in the land. It's, it's really a way of documenting um, that brings a lot of respect and love and intention to what we're able to create and manifest in the tangible. Um, what really is driving like my, I guess, energy around this conversation today, I learned a lot from a Diné scholar, Lila June Johnston. Um, and I put the title of her work on here because yeah, y'all should check it out. It's just really great. She's a great speaker. She does incredible work. She's an artist as well. Um, but this idea of architects of abundance and every time that I'm thinking, okay, what is my role as an indigenous person in climate resiliency? And like, you know, you'll hear a little bit on in the presentation that we reclaimed about 64 acres of land in my ancestral territory, but I've been actively, like I mentioned, I worked for the Boston Harbor Islands. I've been pretty steady in terms of land conservation um, and stewardship for over 20 years. Um, and I keep asking myself, like, what is it that we're trying to do? How do we remember? How do we reclaim where we came from? And the work of like Architects of Abundance is brilliant because I was trained professionally in a conservation kind of a Western mainstream idea of conservation. And it made graduate school very, very difficult for me um, because I couldn't relate. But the purpose of me going was not because I was a hard scientist and felt like that was my destiny um, was because I saw such a lack of um, humanity in the conservation field. <clears throat> um, this connection and relation, not humanity, but relationality. I found a lack of relationality in conservation. And so this idea of architects of abundance talks about how um, there are all of these examples of indigenous peoples all over the globe that have, uh, it kind of debunks this myth of Thoreau, which interesting, interestingly enough, when I first went to grad school at UNH, um, I was TAing an uh, intro to conservation class and they started with Thoreau as the start of the conservation movement. And it kind of, so this architects of abundance work debunks this myth that we didn't have domesticated landscapes. And I think the mourning and grief that I feel when there's that assumption that we were just these wild people and there was no clear indicator that we were actively utilizing the land. I mean, aside from the fact that we were being forcibly displaced, people had succumbed to disease over 90% of the population um, and war was a reason for us to move and to leave, let alone the economic impact of colonialism and what it meant for us, which I'll talk about a little bit later when you start binding the land, um, building dams, et cetera. Um, we, uh, and I'm losing my train of thought, um, but yeah, we actively cultivated, and I think the grief, like I'm saying that I feel um, when I hear all of those things is your, we're forgetting the love, the pouring of love and intention and hope and dreams and teachings and relationships, all the hard work that went into my ancestors cultivating our deer yards, cultivating our blueberry fields, taking care of our riverways, um, just going back to the very basic principle of the fact that we're born into this 
network and collective of responsibility. The um, Haudenosaunee people call it the dish with one spoon. You know, this idea of we're all here in this place together and we have a responsibility so that the whole can survive and be well. Um, yeah, this teachings, these teachings from Lila June talk about how we have these really expansive ways of abundance of food ways are to feed ourselves by creating habitat. Um, and so that I think is my, my North Star uh, is remembering that we understood and appreciated and valued abundance. We had an abundance mindset which is very different than I feel like we're all conditioned to live today is this kind of scarcity mentality. Um, but really it was through our reciprocity. It was through our giving, right? I can't, and this is reminding me recently, I'm hearing somebody at my job say, well, we gotta put our oxygen mask on first and make sure we take care of ourselves before taking care of others. And I'm like, it just feels very contradictory to my teachings and I'm trying to reconcile that, but I think I come from a people who very much understood we will have abundance in our reciprocal relationship and our gifts to others. And so um, that's the basis of the work of rematriating and, um, and agroecology, I believe. So this image right here, um, Lila June also talks about scale and I want us to understand, especially having so many municipalities in this conversation, you know, scale is um, so interesting when we're working with these town boundaries and, you know, your budget line items and, um, you know, all these different management folks and policies, right? Like in a lot of my research, we found it was really the policies that were so restrictive that we couldn't actually, we couldn't actualize, um, that care and reciprocity um, because of all of the restrictions and policies, right? And I think that's that, that dichotomy between the abundance mentality and the scarcity mentality. Um, the individualism, you know, like we're at, at, colonialism brought this idea of this nuclear family and everybody has their bounded property lines and it's, you know, your own family that you're taking care of, but we're, we come from a very extensive extended family. And if we're talking about non-human kin, you know, that, that uh, you know, you need a lot more space, right? Um, so what I love about this image, and this is from a Choctaw, a black Choctaw chef that I've come to know through I Collective. That's, um, I Collective is a collective of indigenous chefs that do a lot of amazing, um, meals like dropping sprinkles of political education while feeding folks. Um, Britt created this illustration of corn mother and that's my daughter harvesting some corn. That was just a few weeks ago. Um, but she's actually this, she's seven. She's been growing since she was in the womb. Like the girl knows how to grow corn. And I think that's just um, pretty fascinating uh, and definitely something we are proud of. Um, but yeah, I love the idea of scale in this image that Britt Reed uh, <clears throat> displays because it's got the, you know, the baby in the womb and this big sun or moon uh, behind the cornfield. And she looks like she's dreaming and praying. And so when we're thinking of scale, um, you know, we can think of the bioregional levels, right? I think the Hawaiians also have a word from it for it, and I'm not, I can't recall the word, but I remember learning in my research of like, they considered everything from the mountainside to the waterways as their scale, right? Every decision that you make, and this is very prevalent in indigenous ideologies, as well as this concept of the seven generations, right? Every decision you make today, you are constantly keeping in mind the, the dreams and the work and the struggles of the seven generations prior and those seven generations yet to come. That's your responsibility because we're here in this very small moment in time in the grand scale of time and universe. And our responsibility in this moment, this is our teachings, is that um, we have a responsibility for every decision to consider the seven generations. Um, and so, yeah, when thinking of scale, 
and the impact of indigenous food ways to know that we have this ideology within this way of working the land that we're thinking of our children yet unborn. Um, so many of our, uh, our, mater our maternal, our, our teachings of our children um, really start before conception. Um, everything from what we eat to the ceremonies we need to be doing, really take into consideration that impact on the fetus and how we're going to make sure they have the best livelihood set up for them, right? Um, this is just really foreign to what we've been conditioned, you know, what my experience has been in a mainstream Western culture. Um, and here it is, right? Like these are some images, um, you know, you see a dam, you see all of these stone walls kind of dividing the landscape. Um, this is another image of, I think that is when there was the famous wood revolt with the Mashpee Wampanoag community and all of this timber being um, extracted and sold to, um, to, to build the ships in Europe. Um, but this like abrupt shift, uh, that's very much a different ideology of bounding the land, um, where one ideology was really rooted in like a giving and a reciprocity, the other seems to be really rooted in this kind of power over dominance. Uh, and when people ask me what rematriation means, this is what I, I really refer to. I think rematriation is really this shift in ideology from, from understanding our unique gifts that we bring to this world as a collective understanding the innate power that every being has to contribute to this collective and nourishing that as opposed to this idea of everything that's around us is for us to dominate and exploit um, is really what has shifted our trajectory and in many ways, uh, even though we're holding on to so much knowledge, I think the indigenous peoples that you meet today are still in this constant state of remembering what it means to live in this way. And, you know, we're doing an incredible job despite all of the complexities to this, um, but it's not easy when you live in this mentality. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the work that, uh, that we've been doing. And um, some of you may have been following the, the work that the town of Natick was doing in terms of the dam removal. Um, well, actually, they were doing work in terms of contemplating whether to remove the dam or to keep it. And I give a lot of credit to the town of being inclusive as with so many voices as they could. I was part of an advisory team that was composed of residents and subject matter specialists in so many different areas. And we went through this, like, I don't know, I think it, it was over a year, maybe a 15 month long process. And my apologies for anyone that may be on this call, <laughs> giving me the answer and I can't see. Um, but yeah, this process of contemplating and teaching each other and having these conversations before we arrived at this decision of whether the dams would be removed or not. And to be quite honest, and I vocalize this because we leave, left space at the end of each call for us to just share our reflections. I was constantly just like, are we having this conversation right now? Like we're really having this conversation of whether to remove a dam that is not at all functional to the purpose of which it was originally designed. And we're showing all the scientific evidence that once we remove this dam, it's only in a matter of hours that the natural systems and processes start to revitalize themselves. But in any case, it's highly controversial and some of the biggest arguments against keeping it were really just concerns over um, the impact that uh, folks that are living near the dam would have, right? Would, would there be flooding? And, um, <clears throat> but, you know, even after the teachings of that, that no, this is kind of a, a slow moving river, like, we're not gonna have some intense rapids. Um, folks felt really tied to the dam as a symbol of, um, in my perspective, it's a symbol of colonialism, right? It's a symbol of 
Um, and as somebody that's gone through a lot of the arguments and debates around mascot removal and things like that, you know, I'm very much aware that there is a, uh, many people hold dear these symbols of settlement um, and who it means to, be, you know, what it means to be an American. Um, so that was a big reason. And then people's recreational desires, some, you know, are, some were worried about how many times they'd have to take their kayak out. And what's really interesting is like Quinobaquin means like meandering, winding river. And then you're going to learn about the property that we reclaimed in Bogusto, which we understand now linguistically as Bogwaso, but it was probably heard as a B, it's a P, but it was probably heard as a B from the um, settlers, is that it meant shallow brook. And so, you know, I mean, when you're naming things for the actual feature of the landscape, it helps you realize like, this is the way creator made it. This is the way the universe made it. And um, it's a good indicator of how we know how to utilize this. Um, you know, a, a, a place that's known as a slow moving, meandering, shallow rivers, you're gonna probably have to take your canoe out several times. Um, oh, one thing I wanted to point out in this, that there was a big part of my motivation for being involved in this advisory committee is the return of our fish. Um, our herring, our alewife, uh, what you'll see in the center of this page is a scholarly work around um, the dams in the Charles River and the impact it had on my ancestors in the early 1700s. So there were actual petitions. Um, they are like my guide, my Bible these days of, you know, everything was written down <clears throat> and these petitions really tell a story. They are petitions of my ancestors to the colonial government um, on a, a lot of different grievances, but many of them relating to land, to actual criminalization of my ancestors where they don't really explain why a person was arrested or needing to pay a fine to get somebody out of jail. But <clears throat> our lands were basically dispossessed by erroneous medical liens um, erroneous uh, criminalization where we had to pay, sell off a couple of acres here and there to get someone out of jail. Um, you know, that's really, it wasn't just the war, it wasn't just the disease, it wasn't just somebody going and putting a dam in. You know, there were a lot of ways, it wasn't the forced removal of my ancestors necessarily, there were a lot of ways we have been dispossessed from land holding through policy um, that was really targeting the need to do something about us, right? Um, but this, this work, this article and the petition actually indicate how my ancestors knew early on the way these dams would impact our ability to source fish and um, the impact it would have on the riverway and the need for the river and the fish to have rights in and of themselves. And I also have a picture of my daughter planting corn seed, because um, not only was this fish like really nutritious and beneficial for us in this particular climate region, um, but it also provided a lot of nutrients to the soil. Um, and, uh, and then you'll see from the scholarly work that as settlement became um, more intensified, a lot of my ancestors in this particular region of Massachusetts um, relied on being able to sell wares and bring food to market. And um, the dams were impacting their ability to um, provide economic revenue for their community and their family, further displacing us. Um, so there it is, Pagua So. Um, yeah, I, sorry, you're hearing my deep breath of taking on 64 acres of land where I have a full-time job and kids. And like I said, we're all figuring out how to remember and what our role is in all of this. Like, fortunately, my oldest is going to an agricultural school, Norfolk Aggie, for anybody who's familiar, she's loving it. And really was the one through all of, I guess, my caretaking and raising of her, she doesn't necessarily want to grow food for her life. She wants to go into medicine, but she thought it was really important for her to learn those skills. Um, you know, we don't have that opportunity as tribal people to engage fully in what it means to have land back and to care for this land and to 
relearn all of the things that were lost through that forced removal, through that um, abrupt impact in our in our cosmovision trajectories. Um, oftentimes, we're learning from settlers. <laughs> we're learning from scientists, and uh, you know, trying to apply our cultural teachings and worldviews to that new science. Um, and so it's going to take some time. So, you know, my hope is that, and this may be far beyond my lifetime, that this place will stabilize and that we'll have more uh, land to be able to live and um, provide and care for each other in, in, such a, in so many varieties of ways that we're unable to, where we're so kind of displaced and dispersed as a community. There's Nipmuc people living all over the state and um, also our traditional territories of Northern Connecticut and Northern Rhode Island. And then we have folks that are living out of state. And that's pretty much the story of a lot of tribal peoples from this area. I'm thinking of like our kinfolk, the Chappaquiddick who literally cannot afford to live in their ancestral territory. They're just totally priced out. There's absolutely no way. Um, so what does it mean for a land-based people to be landless in their own homelands? And what does that mean for the seven generations and, and the trajectory of our cosmovisions? Um, so yeah, I think what I wanna teach here is just, I often find It's just such an interesting experience to feel very lonely in the management of this land as we try to create a home and stabilize it where it's a good home for tribal people to feel trust and safety and returning to live on this land. It's got a five bedroom house, um, two cottages. It's mostly conservation land, but uh, there is a buildable lot. And yeah, we're trying to create the conditions of return and trying to reteach things that our youth and our people have been taught um, and kind of forced to, to not do, right? Like we're, I remember once I went and got cranberries from the bog and I was like, auntie, you know, I got you these cranberries. And she was like, oh, I'm gonna go down and get my like ocean spray down, ocean spray down from the grocery store, right? It, like it's undoing this kind of way that we've been, um, I guess kind of blind in our own participation of colonialism. Uh, so it's gonna take some time, but it's also crazy that I found myself alone when I know so many municipalities would appreciate what we're doing, right? Because the work that we're doing is actually serving to the benefit of a much broader community. When we think about scale, remember, I'm not just thinking about the planting field or the 10 acres of forest, right? I'm thinking about how does this particular parcel fit within the watershed of Bogaso, of Bagwaso, um, which is connected to the Charles River, which is a sacred river of our people. Um, but I also know the Charles River meets and connects with so many other traditional territories that my ancestors um, cared about. And so I'm thinking of that scale in all of this and how we can cultivate and create that abundance that we once had is actually serving ecosystem, it's providing ecosystem services and benefits to a lot of the municipalities, but yet we're struggling. We can barely pay our Wi-Fi and we don't have any staff. We have no staff, not even a part-time person to do this work. Um, here are some images from the land. Um, we've got a lot of diseased oak that we're trying to mitigate trying to get that diseased oak out um, and create conditions where um, we can generate new growth. So you saw an image earlier of me just starting a little oak nursery. Um, that's my daughter right there pruning back some blueberries. Um, and yeah, uh, what we're doing is agroecology. Um, we're applying ecological principles to agricultural systems. And a lot of people say that agroecology agri feeds the world and cools the planet. But what's interesting is I'm hearing like I've been in academic spaces where agroecology is actually devoid of um, an equity-based framework. It's really, again, almost like a repeat of my experience in the conservation field where we're leaving out this relationality. 
So I think it's really important. Um, the teaching here is that, you know, agroecology, you know, you must acknowledge that agroecology is borrowed from indigenous cultivation practices. That were, that's the root of it, because that's exactly how, what we did. And there's a lot of scientific data. We don't need to go down that path right now, but we could talk about the um, concept of burning. Um, you know, what we saw in Maui is very much like, first thing that came to my mind because I had to do a media story on it was like, I know, I imagine Native Hawaiians used to prescribe burns as part of their cultural practices and for main, maintaining their food ways and taking care of their lands. And yep, it was very easy to find that research. So those are the types of things um, I could go on and on with examples, but we definitely practice agroecology. Some people might consider indigenous traditional ecological knowledge. Um, but I think it's important to point out as agroecology, as iTech becomes so, um, as folks become so interested in trending, um, that those practices were actually used as a justification to control, displace, and dismiss indigenous peoples as backwards and uncivilized. So I, I need to be clear. Um, Lisa Brooks is a scholar that writes about this. We got our women, when we had to go and plant, we knew that in the springtime, we needed to be in those planting fields. The survival of our people depended on that. After a peace negotiation with the English, we were ambushed in those fields trying to plant. At a time we were praying for the seven generations. We were praying for those seeds to take hold so that we could feed our people and we were ambushed. Um, so it really is difficult to hear about mainstream orgs that have access to resources and have the ability to have ample land to utilize and cultivate or to some, I feel like just sit and watch things grow and don't actively relate with it. Um, but I hear this word agroecology being used as something that these agencies or land trusts are practicing. But if you're not having or acknowledging the fact that there was a, a violent displacement of indigenous peoples for, for living this way, um, you know, some things you, you gotta you gotta do something about it um, and be prepared if people are gonna challenge your assumption of actually practicing agroecology. Um, the three major components of agroecology is the technical, the cultural, and the political dimensions of land care and stewardship. And so when I mentioned that many of our families were extended families were basically uh, organized politically depending on how we needed to survive and what our place was in the land. That's what I'm talking about, right? Um, there's no way to erase the political dimensions of land care and stewardship in a world where it seems to be driven by the desire to continue to exploit and extract um, and where we all know we need the land to survive, right? It's always going to be political. And so, understanding what has happened in the past and how we continue to organize to prevent um, you know, detrimental things to the environment in the future is part of that political organizing that's a component of agroecology. Um, but also I'm, I'm missing a big piece here, which is organizing against big ag industry, right? Because um, we're learning that the big ag industry is actually um, a leading cause of climate crisis and change. Um, this idea is not really providing us much nutritional value if we're gonna create a genetically engineered salmon. Um, it's not really salmon, don't call it salmon, um, but I'm sure a lot of people are eating it in the restaurants and don't realize that they're not actually eating salmon. So that's the dimensions of agroecology is organizing against this kind of in many ways, a big enemy of the ag industry in the way that it's actually predicated on um, commodifying our kinship in our relationships. Um, it's really predicated on destruction. Agroecology is really predicated on life and abundance. Um, here are some examples of the way we are practicing agroecology. 
um, creating a home for our diversity of animals and species. You know, we know that when our oaks are doing really well and we're able to push back that, um, <clears throat> what's it called, the buckthorn, the buckthorn's not really providing much environmental services or benefits to wildlife. Um, it's creating an inability for our uh, biodiverse landscape. Um, we know that when we're able to create an abundance of um, food for a variety of species, you know, organic farming, even the, even the species, even the potato beetles, right? I have a sign of the potato beetles that we had to pick off the crops. Some of my teachers have said, if you don't have bugs on your food, there's something wrong. You know, if the bugs don't want to eat it, uh, you probably shouldn't be eating it either. <clears throat> um, what we're currently kind of playing with, I know there's a lot of controversy, not controversy, but there's debate around the no-till versus till. Um, we are learning through that practice right now and technically right now doing a no-till planting field. But either way, no-till or tilling with organic cultivation practices, minimal dis soil disturbance is a way of um, carbon sequestration. Um, it's a way of uh, being able to be adaptable to extended periods of drought um, and uh, mitigating uh, additional invasive species, et cetera. We do a lot of companion planting um, that we know can help mitigate pest and disease and, um, and create better crops without the need for herbicides, et cetera. Um, we're practicing relationships based on reciprocity, reciprocity sharing and exchange. Um, there is a question that I was able to see before this uh, presentation that was asking about whether there's any like state policies or municipal policies. I'm sure we could talk all day about that. It's a really great question, especially for everybody that's in the room. But I do wanna highlight right now the local food, um, local food purchase and assistance program, LFPA, that came in through the state of Massachusetts, that's actually a USDA grant. It's been like a game changer for us. As a people that uh, really consider our food as kin and come from a more of a exchange reciprocal worldview, oftentimes when we are pressured to commodify our food sources or bring them to market to be able to make ends meet, to make an income, right? Like this kind of capitalism, cash-based world, um, it basically takes away from those concepts and that worldview and that desire to be in right relationship with the land. Oftentimes the price tag that's paid for that is we start to exploit the natural systems by trying to meet a, de a market demand. Um, and oftentimes I just see that it could be a lot of food waste that comes out of that as well. The LFPA program has allowed us to focus on purchasing from local producers, our fisher folk, our hunter folk, um, our own farms, right? We have families that have their own garden beds, right? Uh, and has allowed us to purchase from them and share out with our community, which is so inherent to our principles and practice of um, being in relationship with each other. And so we've made a little bit of income and it's provided us the opportunity to learn and experiment on what works really well, what are communities are feeling that they really need for food without this sort of pressure for us to make a profit. Uh, so I just wanna highlight that. Uh, and we, ju we just need more policies like that that allow us to be creative and to not have to worry about exploitation or extracting to make ends meet. Uh, ongoing agroecology education, we've had public schools um, come out to the land and we're able to respond to some of their curriculum requirements and their state standards around learning about native histories. This place, Pogwaso, is actually a very historical space. It was one of the first settled homes when Boston became overpopulated um, from the Daniels family. Probably one of the first things they did was put a dam in and start cultivating the land. And uh, the house that we have is the original stone foundation from that house in the 1600s, interestingly enough, burned down by the natives as a defense mechanism and strategy to push back settlement. So that house was rebuilt in the 1700s. Uh, it's pretty incredible story. Who would have known that 400 years later, it took just raising $1.5 million to get that back. One side note about that, 
through the sale of that, there were a bunch of nonprofits that were the beneficiaries of that. If we could ever find out who those nonprofits are, I think it'd be important for them to know that them receiving those gifts was actually part and parcel of um, the exploitation of Indigenous peoples, right? We had to pay $1.5 million to get our land back and we weren't able to receive any of that. Um, but are basically on our own now with trying to figure out how we maintain it and not lose the land again. Um, we are doing a lot of forest studies, working with Yale Forestry, Harvard Forest, and even just local practitioners and people who know, uh, again, to try to get this forest be uh, thriving in a food source for humans and non-humans. Um, we are working with goats and likely uh, cheap in the future to try to avoid large machinery and other ways that folks might, you know, handle a lot of the overgrowth and invasives. The goats are pretty incredible with helping with that. Um, doing a lot of soil and grasslands protection, understanding we have um, acres of pasture and, you know, really healthy grasslands are a rare, um, a rarity these days. And what's our responsibility in continuing to um, provide that? Uh, and, and through all of this, we're weaving our artistic traditions with contemporary land-based practices. <clears throat> we're, you know, making baskets with the bittersweet that we remove. We remove. I'll show you a picture of that in a second. Um, you know, our songs, our uh, the woodwork that we do. All of these things help breathe life into all of our teachings, so that we can see it all around us. Uh, and we're actively involved in policy making rooted in equity frameworks. I've participated on a number of different advisory councils, um, food policy councils, and want to just make sure that we have an active voice in um, bringing our teachings and culture into real time and real policy making. Another partnership worthy of noting is a partnership with the town of Natick. Uh, the, the conservation department where we found, we have a tribal member that's been actively visiting a lot of our cedar swamps. The cedar is really important to us culturally. It's part of our ceremonies and our homes are made of them. Um, it's really important to continue to teach these practices and give opportunities for youth to learn about this, but they're very rare and they're not well cared for. So we found one in Natick and have developed a partnership to create a, a, like a management plan collectively with the town of Natick and how to manage these cedars. But these, these are images of us being able to source the cedar in Natick uh, this past spring. And um, yeah, you'll see right there the frame of the We Too, which we were able to invite public school students out to teach about our um, our traditional housing and it really is meant to be a winter lodge. We have deer on the property and we hunt. Um, and what's interesting is like by reclaiming a lot of our food ways, we can actually do a lot of the environmental management. So this particular cedar swamp has some issues with beavers and beavers are a food source for us. And same thing with deer, right? But I think we've been so conditioned to be a hands off and not really relate to our food ways in that way. We're just seeing these spaces as lands that need management, but it's from this kind of dominance perspective rather than being like, what's our relationship? What does it mean to be in kinship with these beings? And that's why you'll see so many indigenous people very adamant about being able to forage and harvest, um, to be able to eat, because without that connectivity, there's not really a reason why our young people would know that we need to take care of these places, right? Like just the reason that our teachings and our cosmovisions are codified and everything, it's a teaching for us to care. And when you displace that relation, when you disconnect us, when you um, sever that relationship, it's going to be really hard for um, people to care about why they need to take care of these things. But when you're so intimately caught up and your livelihood depends on the well-being of these species, um, then you know that you'll have this kind of ingrained generationally of caretaking. And here's a uh, We've been doing some partnerships with the Charles River Watershed Association, doing some bittersweet removals, and that's a basket made of the bittersweet, which I think is just really interesting because some of our traditional basket making 
um, materials are threatened or um, maybe extinct. And, you know, what an incredible way to figure out a way to adapt to where we're at in terms of what's available, um, helping to mitigate, uh, you know, helping to build a resilient system, but also having functionality and usefulness. Like I always need a basket. And actually I don't have that basket, but I want way more because I'm constantly harvesting, like just putting it in my shirt or like, yeah, I should know by now. I need lots of baskets and we have lots of bittersweet to work with. So plus plus. Um, and that's about it. There's so much more I could say. Thank y'all. I did not think I'd be talking for like a full hour. Um, thank y'all for bearing with me and um, answer any questions. Thank you, Kristen. That was awesome. So yeah, so if you guys have questions, you can put them in the uh, Q&A. Uh, you can also put it in the chat, though I don't want to lose them, uh, just because I know there is some conversation going on in the chat. Um, so yeah, so, so uh, first question. Are there municipal policies or programs that can support these practices and indigenous communities already doing this work? I know that is a, an entire other thing, but is there just anything brief, like little tidbits that people could be thinking about related to that? Because um, you had sort of touched upon. I mean, I almost want to like deflect that question back to the municipalities that are represented here. And like, what are the conversations that you're ha having? Um, I see Claire now that I'm out of uh, speaker view. Claire from Town Natick, it's great to see you. And I think, yeah, I mean, I would actually, I think what they're doing, um, and, and, and it's interesting because there's also this dynamic, um, when our tribal member was harvesting that cedar, there was uh, an issue where the police were called and he faced um, some harassment around that. And I'm making it, I'm watering it down a little bit um, right now, but I can't tell you enough, like how humiliating that is. And, um, you know, especially for after someone's doing that arduous kind of labor and work and also trying to make that spiritual connection, knowing that hasn't been done probably in over 400 years, um, to get that level of harassment is a shame. And so, um, there's so many times that I've wanted to stop and harvest something, or I know it's a state park, or I know it's public lands and I have actually uh, an Aboriginal right that's that's recognized by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, but I don't and I fear. Um, sometimes uh, the, the questioning, right? Um, I've taken my kids to go harvest herring and was stopped by the police. And also, you know, I'm gonna acknowledge I'm a, I'm a white Afro-descending native person and we have a lot of Indigenous people who are Black and Brown and um, their ability to go into public lands is uh, a lot more um, closed off and intense of anxiety, I imagine, than maybe mine, right? But nonetheless, uh, we have a fear around this. But again, I just wanna emphasize that when we're able to go and make these connections, our kids care. Our kids care about this. and what a remarkable story for my teenager to be willing to leave her small town and all her friends and the sports and everything she's built there to try a new beginning out of school because she's committed to learning the agricultural work. So, you know, we need to understand we've got to make space. And I think that it's a shift of a mindset. It's always like, that's the property boundary or what are you taking from me? And oftentimes our fisher folk get harassed, especially in the Wampanoag community that they're overfishing the herring or, you know, you, the harassment is really, um, is heartbreaking and maddening of this uh, assumption that our way of connecting to the land is somehow um, harming other people. And so these are the sorts of policies that municipalities have a responsibility actually like there's that an actual responsibility to make sure that all of your staff and your team is aware of our rights to harvest. Um, and it, it, we could probably strengthen our collaboration and relationship in the bottom line of a lot of these municipalities in terms of their need to caretake lands by developing more of a positive um, abundance uh, mindset relationship with tribal people. 
Um, and the, the LFPA, like how can we create more, more policies that really, I mean, it's benefiting the economy as well for us to try to keep these in-house, like keep our food local. It's required us to do a lot of hard thinking on how we source only local ingredients. Um, and it's been such, like I said, such a game changer. Even just quick example, like we're making a bone broth, a local bone broth to serve, accompanying our dried three sisters soup that we'll be serving. Like we've had to be really creative in how we think about preserving and making shelf stable foods. Um, but my mother is the one doing it. And she's like, I just learned so much about things I've been doing in broth making that I'm like getting rid of nutrients or I'm learning how to make this more nutritious. Um, so anyone who knows about broth, I'm sure that you can relate. Like these sorts of teachings are really so well, Briety, we're practicing, and um, it's crazy that it's the state that made that possible for us to do it. Right. Okay, next question. Um, I will just make a comment only for um, for those who have been joining us for every session, but also for those who may have missed previous sessions. So the rights of foragers and hunters in the indigenous communities was actually brought up by Linda Coombs and Brett Stearns in our last session, session number three. And Leslie Jonas in session number two also talked about cultural respect easements and allowing people to go onto these lands to forage for the stuff without fear of harassment. Again, even though they already have that legal protection, making sure the land stewards are well aware of that legal protection and codifying it in their own sort of easement agreement has really, I think, helped with a lot of that. So I just want to put it up that this is not the first session that these issues have been brought. So again, I think if you're looking for these threads between a lot of these on ways you as municipal people or in conservation groups could be uplifting and supporting um, like Kristen said, I think education around this and support of um, access to uh, the food and everything and the land is really important. Um, kind of going off with the uh, conservation organizations, um, we had a question of how do you recommend conservation organizations move from relationship building to meaningful collaboration with indigenous communities and being actual partners? Um, and everything. This is gonna maybe blow some people's minds here, but I feel firm in this. I've been thinking about this for a really long time. As I mentioned, you know, um, went to UNH for graduate studies in environmental conservation. Conversation starts with Thoreau. I've been working with a variety of land trusts for a really long time. Um, and I explained to y'all how we like to do this work of the 64 acres is a really important place, right? It's a it's not only a historic property that meanwhile, like no historical societies have come to us, right? Like we don't have the capacity to go and do all of this work, but nobody's come and been like, <clears throat> like we just we were able to get a large grant from one of our original donors, and it's most of it is going to restoring this house to make it livable. The roof needs work, the windows need work, the gutters need work. All right, so I can't hire anybody because this needs to happen first. And I'm like, but this is a historic home. Like we're actually benefiting the overall objectives of our historical societies and we're willing to open this up. But literally, like I said, I have a full-time job, life's crazy. I'm also trying to do the land work. We're trying to bring people to this place to know why they wanna do this work again why they would see themselves as there in that landscape and we just don't have the capacity to be doing that sort of development work that a land trust or an organization may have staff already positioned to be able to do that and so yeah i'm just wondering like i'm gonna put it out there what would it be like for a land trust to hire staff whether indigenous or not that is completely dedicated to indigenous-led projects Right, because I've worked in the nonprofit sector for a really long time, and I know the way things play out there. Right, like you want your fundraising, your staff, your objectives to meet what your board wants, to meet what you all think is needed, and the idea of even hiring someone and using your budget for them to carry out their own project must be like, why would we ever do that? 
but I'm going to push the envelope on here and remind everyone that hopefully what I just presented rang true, that like what we're doing in terms of just trying to rematriate, trying to live our livelihoods can actually help your bottom line, right? So oftentimes where we've moved to in this moment of time is that a lot of these land trusts are dedicating their staff time, asking what we need, but what I'm witnessing is we have a lot of tribal folk who are being asked to go do presentations for them or build a we too on their site or burn out a machine on their site. And meanwhile, we're not able to do these things in our own projects, our own indigenous led projects. So much appreciation, gratitude to the organizations who are wanting to take it here. Cause it's very different from when my grandmother was doing advocacy work, right? It was enough for my grandmother just to make sure we were mentioned and even invited to a table. Never mind talking about how an organization can actually serve the, the needs and the benefits of indigenous people rematriating their foodways or reclaiming their territories, right? So that's just a seed I wanna plant. I know there's a lot of conversations in between. So I'm gonna be the one that just goes to the extreme and says, allocate money in your budget for, there's a number of land projects that are happening right now between Native Land Conservancy, Aquina, Nipmuc. I'm talking about Pogwaso, which is 64 acres, but we're having to deny another 60 acres down the street from a farmer that's a rancher that's phasing out. This is in Medway and getting intense pressure from a developer who is also working for the town of Medway. And uh, we don't have the money because we can't compete with what the developers are offering. All right, and we have trouble, tribal people who are sourcing their venison on that property. And there's tons that we could do with terms of creating housing, but we cannot offer or compete with what that developer is trying to push. And honestly, this, person is aging out so much and he's not really even in control with the of the decisions and so it makes it more complex. That's one example but we've also got the farm school in Athol where the farm school is rematriating over 180 acres of land to the Nipmuc community, the Belchertown project. Um, we're actually having to deny there's a lot of folks that are wanting to give land but unless if they're tied up with conservation easements and people can't stay on them um, if there's no way for them to actually make a livelihood and connect in that day to day, uh, we're not able to do our jobs. Any of you who are land stewards or workers know, if you're not able to be there consistently, you're not learning the rhythms and the cycles of the land to know exactly what it needs. Um, so yeah, uh, I could keep going on and on with that one. No, it's yeah. totally, this is amazing. So. Um, I, I know we're we're kind of getting to at time, so um, we're gonna have to stop there. But again, um, some of these uh, books and other things that um, Kristen has mentioned, we will be sending a follow up email with the YouTube link to everyone. Um, so we will put some of those uh, resources into that email. So. Um, Again, I just want to express our sincere gratitude to our speaker, to Kristen, for generously sharing uh, her valuable perspective. And I do hope that this is going to leave a lasting impact on how all of us approach our work, or at least how we are beginning to think about approaching maybe new work. Um, and so I just want to move on to some important announcements for um, we encourage you all to stay engaged with our upcoming sessions. So save the date on your calendar for our last session, which will be on Friday, November 3rd at 12 p.m. So that's next Friday. October is almost done. I know no one can believe it. Um, and that session is going to feature Leslie Jonas, uh, who is Mashpee Wampanoag and was the previous speaker back in September for session two. And she will be talking about the effects of climate related environmental destruction and how it is impacting the lives of indigenous people who have lived off the land and water for millennia. So we are committed to providing you with valuable content, so we hope to see you there. And additionally, we invite you to visit our landing page regularly, and this is where we're going to be updating all the presentations. Um, and lastly, a sincere thank you to all of you for being part of today's very valuable program. We truly appreciate your support. So thank you, everyone. And thank you, Kristen, for joining. Thanks, everyone.